Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Facebook Live with GAE. I am Lisa Morgan, a kindergarten teacher and the current president of the Georgia Association of Educators. And I'm Joe Fleming. I'm the lobbyist for GAE at the state capitol. So thank you for joining us this evening. We do have a guest, um, Senator Randy Robertson, who will be joining us a little bit later. Um, and we will be letting you know all of the news this week. Um, it's been busy, busy, busy at the Capitol, and things are really moving with um, some of the issues that uh, we as educators certainly care about. So, Joe, you want to start us off with where we are? So we'll, we'll save the discussion of retirement for a few minutes. We, uh, we'll get into that pretty deep because there's a lot of really good, good stuff going on that front. Um, some of you may remember last year there was a bill uh, introduced by Representative John Corbett that we supported that would have taken the needs development rating uh, and tried to make it more constructive rather than punitive. In, in particular, uh, my understanding is that if you get two needs development ratings in a five-year period, uh, you, can, you can't renew your certification. So you're basically out of work if you get two of what were intended, I believe, to be constructive ratings. Uh, but we've got new educators and others who get these occasionally. Of course, TEKS is highly subjective anyway, but uh, we understand that uh, that bill will be reintroduced with a new sponsor this year. Uh, I'm very optimistic about the bill. The bill last year passed the uh, State House of Representatives 159 to 4. It passed the Senate Education Committee, but in the crazy last days of the session, never quite found its way to the Senate floor. So uh, excited about that possibility, make some improvements on TEKS. You may also be aware that the Department of Education, and Lisa can talk about this more in depth than I can, but the Georgia Department of Education has uh, begun um, laying the groundwork for a pilot program uh, to replace the TEKS evaluation system. Lisa, do you wanna talk a little bit about that? Yes, definitely. So there are 12 school systems that have been chosen to pilot a new teacher elevation instrument. You notice I did not say evaluation instrument. I had to stop just a moment. Um, the department is being very clear that this is about elevating educators and not evaluate. So the new instrument will be piloted in 12 systems next school year. And um, for our members, before the next meeting, I'm going to be sending you some information. It will come out hopefully in your March e-news for you to provide input for me to take to those meetings. Um, one of the things that we've been talking about is the fact that the 10 standards that we are evaluated on in the TAPS program now will remain the same standards. Um, Dr. Doe has joined us, and so, um, Chair, and I don't know if you would disagree with me, but I have always believed, since I read those 10 standards, that none of us would argue that those standards are not something we as educators are doing. Um, the standards are very similar. I know the North Carolina program um, for their teachers has basically, you know, the wording's a little bit different but it's pretty much the same standards. So under Georgia Leads, we will have the same standards, um, but the program will be based also, we'll have the same components. So there will be observations of teachers in their classrooms, there will be a student growth component, and then there will be a professional development component. The focus, however, will be that it's on differentiating, gosh, we differentiate for our students all the time, and now there will be differentiation for educators. So obviously, a beginning teacher will be focused, the, the administrator who will be observing them will be focused on those very core standards, um, instructional practices, instructional planning, having a positive learning environment, those things that are we all know you have to have them in place before you can do the differentiation and the other things. So the, the Georgia leads will be focused on elevating the practice of educators at whatever level they are. So for a veteran teacher, 
Um, they're going to be looking for something different than they will be for a beginning teacher. And so it will be moving through different phases of our career. Obviously, Sharon and I have been teaching a while. Um, we would not be expected to, we, we would be expected to have more expertise and um, lesson strategies, instructional strategies than someone who is a beginning teacher. So that is the focus of the program. The 12 systems will be piloting it next year. And I am unclear at this point. When I heard there are 12 systems that are piloting, I thought that would mean that every teacher in those systems would be participating in the pilot. That may not be what's going to happen. It may be selected educators in selected schools. Or it, so that's one of the things that I'm getting more understanding of how the pilot is actually going to work and then how we go from pilot to revision to implementation and will there be a second pilot? Those are still open questions. So that obviously means the timeline for when this could replace teacher keys is also an open question. So that's one reason I'm excited that um, it was House Bill 1295 last year that it's coming back um, because we all know that um, I, when I testified about HB 1295, it's about the adverbs. And for needs development for each one of those standards, it says that the teacher inconsistently does whatever we're supposed to do. Well, if you're inconsistently doing something, that means you're maybe working on getting to consistently doing it. And everybody at some point is going to need some more assistance to get to where they need to be. And you should not lose your career because you are still becoming a good teacher. Yeah, so it's exciting. Lisa is on that. Uh, pilot uh, program committee that's developing the standards and will evaluate the pilot program. But in the meantime, yeah, it could be years. Uh, they may never implement the pilot program. So we're excited to be able to, to make some improvements to the existing TEAC system uh, while it is here. So another bill that I expect that could be introduced as early as tomorrow, uh, it's a, it, it seeks to improve legislation that became law last year that allows retired educators to return to the classroom uh, full time while still drawing their TRS benefits. So this is a bill that's designed to address the critical shortage of educators, particularly in certain uh, subject areas. Uh, and we understand that there's a bill coming that would expand what, what the bill uh, or what the law calls, high, I think, high need areas. Um, some of the times it's math, it, it depends on, I can't remember if Lisa is by Risa, but it, it, it by Risa. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so by Risa, different subject matters where there's a critical shortage are, um, are identified. And then uh, in those areas, the retired teacher can come back to work again full time with full benefits. Uh, so look for legislation that I'm excited about that would expand those areas. Unfortunately, they kind of narrowed the pool last year to eligible to, to a to a pool of eligible retired educators that was pretty small. And the result is that so far only 211 teachers, retired teachers that have taken advantage of the program. The concept's good, I think, uh, but we, but, but it, it, it needs to be expanded, especially if we're serious about uh, the shortage of educators and especially in the high need areas. So that's another bill that we've got. Lisa, I know you're excited about this and uh, we've got a bill on duty-free lunch and planning time committee. It's uh, House Bill 340. Uh, it's also by Representative John Corbett. John is also a committee chairman. He chairs the motor vehicles committees from down near, well, he's from Lowndes County. Uh, but you want to talk a little bit about that bill? That's, that's an exciting piece of legislation. I think I'm excited, but I will be more excited if we can get um, an amendment that will say this bill cannot be waived. Um, that would be 
our best scenario. Um, obviously, we know that the current duty-free lunch law is only for kindergarten to fifth grade elementary teachers. And this would add a 30-minute unencumbered, meaning no duties, duty-free time. They're calling it planning time for middle school and high school. But unfortunately, it doesn't have that magic phrase at the end that it cannot be waived. And we all know that um, Sharon's nodding her head. If it can be waived, we're going to lose that time. Um, and I, I think it's a recognition that um, educators um, are human beings and we do need um, restroom breaks. Uh, we do need breaks for lunch. Um, we do need a break to um, have some food. Um, we need a break to just sit and breathe before you continue. Um, so yes, I am excited. I think Sharon will probably be very excited because I know she's in mid a middle school and high school. So um, that will be something that we would definitely look forward to and we would hope that you know it would include that it cannot be waived. Um, I correct, Lisa. My high school days, high school days are fine. But on my middle school days, when my lunch period is 20 minutes and I have to walk them down, then I have to get whatever I have for lunch and use that as my bathroom time. Then I have to go get them. So it makes the lunch period very, very short. Yeah. You walk them down, that's five minutes. You get your lunch, you use the restroom, that's 10 minutes. And it's time to go back and pick them up and you haven't eaten your lunch yet. Lisa and Dr. Doe, am I correct that on it is in law now, duty-free duty lunch time uh, up to the fifth grade, is that correct? Yes, K-5. The bill appears to strengthen the, the necessity for having that, although you're absolutely correct, it could be waived. Does it also create for the first time that kind of planning period time? It, for it six through 12? It creates that unencumbered time for six through 12. Um, and I think what will happen, um, even though it's called planning time in the bill, I think that will really become lunchtime for our educators in six through 12, because right now they literally do not have that time at all. And so, yeah, I think that's, I think that's what will be important um, to have that time. Well, Lisa, in the times that we don't have subs for some mm -hmm. teachers, can those teachers be called out on that time to go and cover classes? If I'm remembering correctly, the bill says one time a week for K-5 and only two times a week in 6 through 12. So, so it limits the number of times that teachers can be called out on that specific time. Yes, yes. And I would hope that we would go to only one time a week for all educators, um, that you would be losing it because of an emergency. And I think it says an extreme emergency, but it seems like extreme emergencies are happening every day with the lack of subs across the state. I have not talked to an educator yet who has said my system has enough substitute teachers. <laughs> Nowhere. A couple of things. Um, you know, one of the things, Lisa, you testified before the Senate uh, Study Committee on Education Funding that's a priority for GAE. It's to increase funding for school systems that have a large number of students who live in poverty. Uh, that concept has really kind of gained some traction. Uh, there's a bill in the House, HB3, from Representative Sandra Scott. Um, we've had discussions with the chairman of the Study Committee on Education Funding. I, I think the need for that kind of QBE weight for poverty has certainly gotten his attention. So we... We've got good things happening in that area. You know, another thing, it's been a huge issue this session, but but hasn't really resulted in legislation yet is the whole whole issue of literacy. Right. I think some 
legislators uh, report came out and it showed that uh, at the third grade level, many are not uh, testing as well as they did pre-pandemic. Um, and I, I think that's concerned some legislators. I know the, the Senate Education Committee and the Senate Higher Education Committee, I believe have had five hearings on literacy uh, and they've agreed to dedicate a portion of each of their individual hearings uh, for, the, for the near uh, future to also discussing literacy at those committees. So um, there was a house study committee that, that had a hard time getting going last year on literacy. So it's really become one of the most talked about issues at the Capitol so far this year when it comes to education um, matters. Um, so we're excited to be a part of that process as well and um, look forward to helping to develop legislation that will make a real difference in that area. Today, the Senate uh, Higher Education met and heard from two other groups today on literacy uh, with really impressive presentations. So i um, delighted to see that going forward. Lisa, I think we may have had the Senator on there for a second. Um, I, I don't know if that was him or, or Carly, um, but okay. uh, uh, hopefully he'll jump back in. Yeah, hopefully if it was him, he will be able to jump back in. Um, and one thing about the literacy, and I, I'm just going to say this, kindergarten teacher in me has to say it. Um, I think they spent a lot of time discussing test scores and not a lot of time discussing children. And I think with literacy and learning to read, one of the biggest things that so often gets left out is motivation. And that children, when they begin, when they come to kindergarten, they want to learn. They want to learn to read and write. And when we make it not about communicating and reading and writing to communicate, but test scores, we kill that motivation. And Sharon, I don't know, you're in middle school, um, but I know that we've heard that, you know, high school students don't want to read anymore. Um, I don't know how your middle school is, but we're seeing it with some of our elementary students that that desire is no longer there. Well, that's definitely true among high school students. But I think they just rather read on a different platform. Mm -hmm. We all thought the electronic books would go by the wayside, but no, they're, they're still here. And our students actually prefer the electronic version of the book to the physical copy of the book. But for me, it's nothing like having a physical copy of the book. Okay. Uh, Senator Robertson, is that you joining us? I'm afraid it is. I'm walking, but I'm joining y'all. Well, welcome. Thank you so much for joining us this evening. And um, I would like to introduce Senator Robertson. He was chair last year of the Senate Retirement Committee. I'm on call, so I'm going to go and, um, Held hearings concerning the Public School Employees Retirement System. And Senator Robertson, we would like to thank you for holding those hearings and for helping us bring this issue to the forefront um, for these very important employees. Yes, and, and I appreciate that. And um, of course, Senator Walker was with me on that. And um, we are still moving forward with some ideas to help those employees, such as removing the cap on the multiplier and some other things that I think we can do fairly quickly, mm -hmm. but also, um, looking at long-term plans and opportunities to try to strengthen those positions so that y'all don't have such a hard time recruiting and retaining good, you know, staff uh, in the food service and the bus drivers, maintenance and custodial services. Yes, sir. And I, I would like to say we get good people and um, they stay for the same reason a lot of educators stay because of their love for the children. And, That's uh, right. They really need to be rewarded with a um, retirement that is a retirement that they can live on once they get there. I, I agree 100%. And it has to be something that they're, 
as they move on, and, and I agree, you know, my, my 30 years in law enforcement was never because of the salary. It was because of the love for the job. But at the end, really all I had to, uh, you know, I always had the opportunity of looking ahead at a good pension plan. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think that's the least we can do for these dedicated employees. Yes, sir. So I want to ask you, because this is your first time with us, and we always um, ask this question. So you are in the state Senate. I know you're from uh, near Columbus. So what what was your why? What led you to a career as a state senator now? Well, I'm going to be honest with you. I think it's just public service. And I think you alluded to it earlier. You know, teachers, law enforcement officers, nurses to a certain degree. But those of us who get into government um, to serve our fellow citizens, I'm afraid we become somewhat infected with that, uh, the adrenaline that comes with taking care of each other. And mm -hmm. so that's kind of what led me to that after retirement. So, uh, and to be honest with you, I, right now, I think I made a good choice. That may change uh, tomorrow, but today I think we made a good choice. Uh, that's that's one of those things. Uh, we as educators, we sometimes have those days when we question, but uh, <laughs> if you go back the next day, you're going to find something that will make you smile again and make you realize why you're there. Well, and when it comes to the um, to getting the pension squared away for these folks, I think right now that's the bone that myself and uh, Chairman uh, Walker have gotten a hold of, and we're going to kind of I think we want to stay with that until we until we get done what needs to be done. So because of your hearings, we now have a bill that Senator Walker, Chairman Walker, has introduced that I, I believe is on the agenda for the Senate Retirement Committee. Um, can you tell us a little bit about that legislation and what it does? Well, I believe the legislation you're referring to is the one that, that removes the cap on the multiplier. So what it does is open up a lot of opportunities when it comes to appropriations and funding. Um, when we start pushing that type of uh, funding out there, we're not limited by how much we can do. But at the same time, we're also pushing other ideas forward when it comes to those positions. Uh, we're, I've, got, um, I've got an intern who's researching all the school districts. We wanna find out to ensure who is giving, putting into Social Security who's not. Uh, we're, we're trying to do a study to see what the average pay is in those positions, the openings in those positions, and to try to determine exactly how good and bad the situation is so that when we approach it, we can do it in an intelligent way. But the bill right now is, is I think, by removing that cap, we've given ourselves some opportunities to really uh, contribute some, some, some good money to those funds, hopefully in the near future. That's terrific. I know, and, and you know this, Senator, uh, some of our members may not, but the average monthly benefit for our school bus drivers, cafeteria workers, custodians, maintenance personnel that are in the PSERS is $290 a month. Um, I, Senator Walker has asked me to do, do some research on whether school districts are participating in the Social Security system, because I know we heard in Columbus a number say that they don't see FICA taxes coming out and they're not they're not sure that their district's participating. But it appears like for these type of employees, they're supposed to be paying into Social Security. So um, trying to get some answers on that too for you guys. Yeah, I really do appreciate that because the only way we're going to be able to solve this problem is with the facts and the data points needed to, um, to hold the school district's feet to the fire and make sure they're doing the right thing by these employees. But... Um, I'm gonna have to jump off this call, but listen, uh, just know that I'm an advocate. Uh, my office is always open and that's uh, not just during the session, it's year round. Anything I can do to help you guys, whether I'm on retirement or not, uh, I'm 100% uh, on y'all's side and, and look forward to helping solve this problem. Thank you, Senator. And thank you for joining us this evening. Thank y'all, y'all be safe. Thank you. Okay, um, so, uh, I have put the link in the comments for those of you who are watching this evening to um, our two-click system where you can uh, send a letter to your state representative and your state senator in support of Senate Bill 105. 
Uh, they may not know what it's about yet, but we want you to send that email. And when you click on the link I put in the comments, it's going to take you to, we've prepared a text. I encourage you to edit that, make it your own. Talk about that cafeteria worker, that bus driver, that custodian that is in your school, how important they are to you and how much they deserve to have a retirement that allows them to retire with dignity. So I did put that in there and we are asking everybody to please click on that and send a message to your legislators. Lisa, this is an, so exciting um, because of these hearings and because of our members, all members, but our ESP members as well, we've gotten to the point where we've got a bill. And, and for those that aren't totally familiar with the system, I, thought, I think it may be good to just kind of explain the situation as it exists now and what we're trying to do. Um, so there, as the Senator referred to, there is a limit on how much uh, the monthly benefit can grow for a ESP in the PSER system. And that's $16.50, that's in state law. The current, what we call multiplier is at $16. So the bill that we're talking about and, and which will be heard again by the Senate Retirement Committee actually eliminates that cap altogether. So it could grow as high as legislators are willing to fund it. Um, and that, Lisa, I understand is a two-year bill, is that correct? Yes, so yes. It would be another, so they would, they would hear this bill, then there would be an actuarial study, and then it would be 2024 before this bill could pass. But in the interim, what's exciting is that there's an effort in both the Senate and the House to provide the money to go from 16 to 1650, which again is the limit right now. After 2024, we can move it up uh, as high as we as high as we can get it. But it's it's exciting. It's created also this really interesting discussion about the, the lack of a salary uh, step schedule for ESP, how poorly they're compensated. Um, it's, it's brought attention to the issue of WEP and GPO with regard to the social security system. It's just opened up so many um, uh, opportunities to talk about some of the really important issues that are affecting educators. Yeah. And um... I'm, I'll be honest, Joe, I, the bill that's coming to completely eliminate the cap, I, I didn't think that that would be what it would be. Um, I was excited thinking that we were going to, you know, raise the cap to 20 or 25, but to completely eliminate the cap, um, that's very exciting. And uh, it also sets the floor at $17, which would mean if appropriations is to sixteen fifty this year, then next year appropriations we would go to seventeen hundred to seventeen dollars, which for somebody who has taught who has worked for thirty years, we would be going from four hundred and eighty dollars to five hundred and ten dollars, um, and I think that's important to note that thirty dollars might mean the difference in a lot of things. Is it enough? No, it's still not enough. But as Senator Robertson said, it's not something that we can fix overnight. It is going to be a process. But right. the process is moving. And that's that's very exciting. And, and one of the things he talked about also is, so it, it, it appears to me that even if a, a school district opted out of social, the social security system years ago, it, it appears that, that they're required to continue to pay into social security for exactly these kind of uh, uh, the employees in PSERS because TRS is a qualified plan. They don't have to participate in uh, social security for, for those in TRS, but because PSERS is not a qualified plan, it's kind of a sub, considered a supplemental plan. They should be paying into Social Security. So there should also be Social Security benefits coming to these, to these ESPs. Well, we heard in Columbus, a number say they don't, they're not seeing FICA taxes coming out of their paycheck and they're not sure their district's participating. And I think that one of the things 
that has gotten uh, Chairman Walker and, and Senator Robertson's attention is, are they doing that? Are they paying into the Social Security system for the benefit of our ESP members? So uh, a lot of good stuff is coming out of this, which is very excited. It's also, we've got a bill in the ha uh, House, John Corbett's bill, Lisa, uh, which you may want to talk about as well, that uh, gives an option. Yeah, so, and I'm excited about it because again, it's a possibility. We don't know, we don't have the data to say the what the ultimate solution is for these employees, but it's a bill that would give employees an option if it's passed, based, and it's all going to be based on the actuarial study once they know what it's going to cost, but would give them the option to move into the teacher retirement system. Now, obviously, if they did that, they would be paying more. They would, they would be putting in more each month. And I think that's one of the things we're going to have to look at is at what point is that a good thing for the employee to do? What's that break? What's that tipping point? where the increase in your contribution and the increase in your benefit makes the increased contribution a good idea. And I think that's something that we're going to have to look into. Uh, but again, this will be a two-year bill. It will, they'll have to have a study over the summer and then it will come back next year with all the information, all the data telling us exactly what it would cost. And I think that's important. And then we need to know what is that tipping point? Where does this become feasible for an employee to move to switch systems and obviously contribute more? Um, and we're going to have some districts that won't be happy with that because as the employee will be contributing more. The employer will be contributing as well. So yes, I have a question for Joe. Yes, you mentioned that PSERS is a supplemental retirement system. So yes. why is it considered a supplemental retirement system? I think, it, and, and Lisa may know more about this than I do, but when it was created in the 70s, that's what the way they viewed it, it was, was that many of these are considered part-time workers by their their employers. Um, I mean, I, I tell legislators when I talk to them about this, you know, every school bus driver I know at this time of year is up before the sun rises and is home before the sun sets. I don't know when, you, when we expect them to have time for another job that might offer better retirement benefits. So, um, I, I think that I, I view that more as of a kind of a historical term in, in the way that it was initially set up as they, they see, they saw them as part-time workers. Yeah. Okay, Joe, let's move on from retirement because we do have a question in the comments. Um, and this is, can you share information about the program the governor talked about for paraprofessionals to get certified to teach? Yeah, let me get my notes in front of me. So just to give a little background, every year the governor of the state is required by the Constitution to prepare a budget and present it to the General Assembly. Um, he, pre he presents two budgets every year. He presents one budget that makes changes to the current year budget. So for example, in education, if there's been a big shift in FTE counts, the, the adjusted budget for this year would, would reflect that. And then he pro, uh, proposes a budget for the next fiscal year, which actually is concurrent with our school years in Georgia. So in his initial budget, um, he proposed $15 million to encourage, which is not really a lot of money in the state. We've got a budget of about $32 billion. So um, but 15 million to encourage paraprofessionals and offer grants, but encourage paraprofessionals to become certified educators. And it's a, a, a tool that he thinks will help um, address the, the teacher shortage uh, as well as some other things that are being proposed. Unfortunately, in the House, they cut that from 15 to $5 million. So uh, they, they pretty much 
almost eliminated it. So we're, we're, here's where we are. The budget for the adju budget adjustments for this year have already passed the House. And, and that version, again, cut the, the effort to get uh, paraprofessional certified from 15 to 5. It's now beginning to, be, beginning to be heard in the Senate. So hopefully we can restore some funding there, uh, maybe even increase the funding that the governor uh, presented, because it's, a, it's a, I think, a good idea to, to also address the teacher shortage. We've got education professionals already in there with some experience and, and uh, helping them get the certification. So um, that's fluid uh right now yeah okay so i hope that's the information that you needed um i will say that i know some school systems have some of these programs and you should check with the um hr in your school system because we do i know some systems already had these programs in place to um help our paraprofessionals uh, become fully certified so I hope you will check that out and um, we'll keep watching the budget process. Um, and while we're talking about the budget, Lisa, yeah. <laughs> yeah, there's a few other things that we can point out. Um, the governor's proposed another $2,000 uh, pay raise for certified teachers. Uh, he's proposed $7,000 and $7,000 will be implemented if this budget for next year goes through. Um, unfortunately, because there's no state salary schedule for our ESPs, there's very little state funding for our ESPs uh, and no minimum salary set by the state. So they will not be getting a pay raise unless their local school district uses their own local funds or any federal money they get for that purpose. In the past, we've been able to get bonuses for ESPs as a way to try to um, in lieu of a, a, of, of a salary raise because we don't have the salary step schedule. But again, back to the, the retirement system for ESPs, it's given us an opportunity to talk about the fact that there's no state salary schedule and the need to begin to move toward one. So um, some good news there and some unfortunate news there. Um, there was also a um, pretty hefty amount, $25 million in the governor's budget for what he calls the learning loss. I know Lisa cringes when she hears that, hears that term. Uh, that, was completely, that was completely removed in the house. I think in part because there was never a specific program or uh, really any sp uh, programming attached to it. They did add 1.25 million for character education, uh, which I'm not really quite sure how that would be spent. Um, there is some money in there for 300 new school buses in the state. That's great, but it's, it's just a, a really, really small amount com compared to the total transportation costs that used to be paid largely by the state, but if the state's funded less and less transportation, so school districts are having to pay more and more for new buses, maintenance, uh, fuel. Um, so um, there, there's some good things in there, but the, there's so much more that can be done. I know Lisa, we were in a hearing the other day where they were talking about suicide screening and, um, you know, it's pointed out that we have one school psychologist for every, I think, six or 7,000 kids. Uh, you know, it's one of the reasons I think that when voucher bills come along or talk comes of uh, spending more tax dollars on private schools, like, just because you're fu fully funding QB doesn't mean you're funding it well at all. There's so many needs that are unmet. And we talked earlier about, you know, funding for districts that, that have a number of students in poverty. School social workers, the ratio isn't much better either. Um, and, you know, we still have to make uh, salaries even more competitive. We're, we're still, and for, for starting teachers, behind Mississippi uh, in starting teacher salary. So, uh, you know, to be compared to Mississippi and, and be compared unfavorably with them is not generally seen as a good thing. Um, so th there's a lot that, more that could be done and, and we're, we're working to try to get that done. There is a bill, I don't think it has a chance of passage, but it would raise the starting salary for educators or first year teachers with no experience to $50,000, uh, which is good. Glad it draws attention to it. I'm, I, I hope it passes, we'll, we'll, we'll be talking it up, but I, I think it's, 
I think he's got a, a tough road this year. Joe, could you tell us about the governor's proposal to modify the Hope Scholarship? So, yeah, so this is kind of interesting. And, and again, you guys may know more about this than I did, but a few years ago, uh, I think when state revenues were a little lighter, they pared back the amount of funding so that it once covered, I believe, 100% of tuition, but was dropped to 90%. Um, and I know Representative Stacy uh, Evans uh, has been fighting for this for a while, and it, it is, I believe, in the governor's budget that would restore that to 100% funding of tuition. Now, I think, but correct me if I'm wrong, guys, there was a time when uh, books and fees were covered too. This does not return books and fees to what HOPE covers, but, but does move from 90 back to 100% of tuition uh, costs. There are a lot of HOPE bills this year, by the way. So there's bills to make HOPE uh, or create a HOPE that is needs-based, which is a great thing. And I think it was, again, what HOPE originally was, had a need-based component to it. It certainly needs one. Um, and, you know, I'll mention this too, Dr. Doe. There are two bills, uh, at least, one in the Senate and the House, that would legalize sports betting. So you could go to a place or go, even go to, say, the Atlanta Braves baseball game uh, and bet on the outcome of the game. Um, these are bills that don't believe that a constitutional amendment is required because they're doing it through the Georgia lottery. So the money from sports wagering would go to Hope and Pre-K. So maybe that would help restore some of what Hope once was. Yeah, <laughs> um, I always, uh, so if you're gambling and there's profits, that means, uh, yeah, okay. <laughs> I'm not suggesting we take a position on it. Uh, I'm just mm. reporting the fact. Yeah. Um, I'm not one of those people that likes to give away my money, so uh, I won't be participating <laughs> if it is approved. <laughs> uh, Joe, I want us to talk about briefly, uh, we've talked about the budget. Um, we've talked about our good bills that are coming. Yeah, yeah. Um, we know there are some bad bills out there too. Yeah, uh, there are. Um, probably maybe at the top of the list is HB 54. This is a bill from the chairman of the House Retirement Committee, John Carson from Marietta. Uh, he tried last year to double, uh, well, let me say this first. There is a tax break in Georgia law that, that rewards and incentivizes donations to private schools. Uh, it, it currently, or prior to last year, cost the state 100 million a year. Uh, he would double it from what was 100 million a year ago to 200 million a year, which I think, I'm not very good at math, but it's two, bill, two, two billion dollars every 10 years. Um, and again, it's 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 a strict to me a bizarre state policy to say, oh, we must be encouraging people to give more money to private schools, um, and and pay for private school tuition. So uh, we beat that back last year. He tried to du double it last year, but uh, we I, I consider GA the reason that it didn't didn't pass. So that's back so far. And by the way, it's not in. The education committee, it's in the tax committee, which is called the Ways and Means Committee, but it's not been uh, brought up for hearing yet. So, you know, we're, we're getting closer and closer to crossover day. Uh, crossover day is the day in which a bill filed in, in, um, in one chamber must, have, must clear that chamber to be sent over to the other chamber. So in this case, HB 54, would have to pass the House before March 6, 9, I've, I've forgotten already, but the crossover day coming up um, to, be, to be eligible to be conserved for the rest of the session. So uh, we're on guard for that. We've got bizarre bills. We always have bizarre bills. We've got a bill that would decrease the penalty for passing a school bus or speeding in a school zone, would decrease it from $250 to $10 and proposes that the second offense be $20. So 
uh, kind of, in my mind, pretty crazy legislation. Um, uh, yeah. That sounds to me like uh, somebody is giving people um, a, a get out of jail free card real quick. Um, if you're going to decrease the fine for speeding in a school zone that um not very safe, I would say. And, and I think it's some of them are paranoid about cameras that are either installed on school buses or in school zones. Um, so we've not seen any movement on that bill. Um, I don't know that I don't know what its prospects are, but if, if it's we get those kind of bills every once in a while, they're just kind of crazy. Um, can I just say, I don't know if y'all have those cameras near your homes, um, but there's a school literally in front of my community, and there is a camera there that will take a picture of your tag and send you a ticket in the mail if you speed through that school zone, and it is very clearly marked on the sign that tells you what the speed limit is in the school zone, that there's a camera and the camera's white on a pole, it's very easy to see. So it's not like you haven't been warned that it's there and that you can see it to slow down. So yeah, we always have bills. We've got really, really good bills that, that, that we love that just because of the politics of the General Assembly you know, we got bills, for example, the Democrats introduced that are not going to go anywhere because Republicans don't like passing Democrat bills. Uh, that it's not universal. Occasionally, bills come along that a Democrat offers that do get through, but it but it is not often. Um, right. So there's some really good bills, thoughtful bills introduced by Democrats that just because of partisanship won't make it. Um, I'm going to stop us for just a second because we need to have a commercial for GAE Day at the Capitol. Um, we are one week away. It is next Thursday, February 24th. And um, we have a lot of people who have signed up already, but we can, there is no number that we will say is too many um, to be there. And we want you to sign up and join us that day. We want you to be there to speak to your legislator um, in person about these good bills and maybe some of the bad bills um, so that they can hear from you, from someone back home, someone who is in the classroom or on the bus in the cafeteria every single day. So I put the link in the comments. Please sign up and join us. Uh, we will have lots of speakers that day. We'll give you breakfast early in the morning. We'll have lunch and lots and lots of information. Make it a free t-shirt out of it too. Oh, okay. <laughs> so I've heard. And so, so uh, okay. Yeah. I kind of heard something about a t-shirt and maybe a, uh, some other, uh, mementos, I guess we could call them, uh, from GAE. Um, this is such an important event because, it, the, you know, we talked about the retirement system for ESPs, and it's a great example where when you're engaged in the process and face-to-face -face talking to a legislator and telling your personal story, it, it, it can just change everything. And a huge show of force at the Capitol uh, where we can promote the bills that are good for education and, like Lee said, work to defeat the bills that are bad for public education. Uh, man, it, it's just no substitute for it. And quality and quantity being down there and talking to legislators about these issues. And, and that they will see you. They will, you're their constituents. You vote in their races. Um, which is also why we have the legislative contact team where we, we try to pair educators uh, with their local legislators to become kind of that hometown expert. So, you know, if an education bill comes up and the legislator is not an expert on it or has questions about it, that they can pick up the phone and, and talk to you or send you a text message or an email and say, how should I vote on this or explain this to me? You know, Lisa and I are down at the Capitol almost every day of the session, and uh, I, I think we 
not blowing our own horn, but I think we do some pretty good work down there, but it is nothing compared to what a constituent educator can do. And this is a great opportunity to do that. I think we're gonna kick off at about 7.30 for registration program around eight, maybe 8.10, something like that. I think we should be done by 2.30-ish, possibly three. We have a couple of, well, we've got a couple of invitations out for some really, really big speakers that, uh, that uh, would be a huge draw if they could come down. We do have the Senate Retirement Chairman coming. We have the Senate Education Chairman coming. We've got the House Education Chairman coming uh, and key legislators from both parties coming down. So it, it'll be a good time. You'll learn a lot, uh, but you can also make a difference. Yeah, and I will say, um, our members don't feel like you have to know what the bills are before you get there. We're going to have the handouts for you that say Senate Bill 105. This is this is what we're talking about. This is what the bill does. This is what we want our legislators to do. So we will have all that prepared for you, give it to you. Um, so you have that information. You don't have to feel like you need to know. We need you and your story about what's happening in your classroom every day. Um, that's the important part. The bill numbers and all that other stuff, we can give you that information, and we will. Um, and then we'll also help you know how um, to, quote, work work the ropes. And, you know, we'll show everybody how to fill out your form, how you get, and for your legislator to come out for you to actually talk to them. Just a couple of notes on it, just logistically. Parking's going to be tough down there. It always is yep. when they're in session. Um there is a mortar station that actually lets out in the building where we're beginning and ending the program. That's called, the, I think it's still the Georgia State mm -hmm. uh, Station. Um, uh, Uber or, or carpooling, highly recommended, but, but keep in mind parking is tight. You will need a state ID, uh, whether it's identification card, driver's license. Um, but uh, yeah, excited about it. Okay. And um... So there are some other bills that I'm going to, I'm not going to name the sponsors. I'm going to, going to name the numbers because I'm not, I don't want to amplify them, but there are some bills where um, we have representatives who think they know better than educators and even parents, um, how to educate our children, how to raise our children. And um, obviously we, um, would oppose those that would uh, create more barriers for students, parents, and educators working together for the needs of all our students. Um, and we know that some of that is, um, I guess, monkey see, monkey do, because monkeys in other states have introduced this legislation. So um, somebody here thought they needed to uh, follow along and um, that's not who we are in Georgia. Um, as educators, we have the Georgia standards of excellence and that is what we teach each and every day. And those standards have been approved uh, by the State Board of Education. They've been out for public comment. That's what we are teaching. And that is what we will continue to teach because that is what educators do. So anyone that would suggest otherwise is listening to disinformation and not talking to educators and parents here in Georgia. And that's just, I think that's all we need to say about it. So, um, Joe, anything else? I think we've covered. There's a lot happening. <laughs> There's a lot happening. It's kind of been a strange session because because we have uh, redistricting and so many new faces at the Capitol. We literally had fifty three. Is that right? Fifty three new legislators. We have new chairman all over the board. Uh, you know. Regrettably, the Speaker of the House passed away shortly after the election. So we have new leadership in the House. We have new leadership in the Senate. So I think because of that, it's taken the session a while to get going. But 
Um, so there have been, and there are actually some committees that haven't met until this week for the for the first time. So things are moving slower, but they're coming up, like I said, on that deadline where they got to get stuff through their chamber. So I think the pace is going to pick up substantially in, in uh, the next week. And by day at the Capitol next Thursday, it, it, I suspect we'll have a lot to talk about about what's going on, committee hearings going on, votes scheduled, et cetera. Okay. So um, we have good, we have bad, and we have some not so good, but we will deal with all of it uh, next week at Day at the Capitol. And once again, we invite all of you to join us. Um, if we have to get a bigger room, we will get a bigger room. Um, be very happy to. Uh, if you have not already registered, please register, and then you will receive the information from us um, about parking and where we're going to be meeting and all that good stuff. And I would ask you, however, when you register, please register with your personal email and not your school email. Um, we don't really like to send our organization information to school emails. So that would be my last please. Um, so as we end, um, we will be back for Facebook Live on March 1st. And I think, Joe, you said, I think when we get to March 1st, we will definitely be um, in, the, in the thick of the session and have lots and lots to talk about. Um, and look forward to seeing everyone then. And uh, thank you for joining us this evening. Um, and everybody have a good day. We're through a couple of minutes early, but if you're like me, a couple of minutes early is a good thing this time. You don't want to give us a membership uh, update, Lisa? Uh, I didn't print it out. So. <laughs> well, we're still kicking butt. Yeah, yeah we're, we're still in the top five. We're still recruiting new members, um, and we have members joining every day, and we invite you to join us. Um, I will say we have seen a big increase in our bus driver members. And I think that's because we are dealing with the PSCRS issue and the issues that impact them each and every day. So yes, excited. So everyone have a great rest of your evening. We'll see you here in two weeks on March 1st. If we don't see you next Thursday at Day at the Capitol, everybody have a good evening. <laughs>